Now, so today is kind of interesting because, um, oh, that is out of focus, isn't it? Uh, Quite a bit. Better. Thank you. And um, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, my name's Kevin Bloom. I'm the political director for the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. And um, I'll tell you a story and give you plenty of time um, to ask questions. This is mostly about um, what happened. I moved to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project in 2008. Started a brewery in, Man in Concord called Manchester Brewing. And um, it was closed down by the action of certain Anheuser-Busch distributors who we won't name, uh, except that it was a great state. And uh, <laughs> anyway, um, after that, I had a lot of problems with the, um, with the state. Crazy liquor laws. Every state has crazy liquor laws. Not a single one of them. Uh, you know, you can compare everybody to Utah or um, whoever you want to. They all have something strange in their laws. Some are control states, and some of them are are not. Fortunately, this trend is accelerating the other way. Um, there's a thing called the three-tier system, which most people will never run into except that there's manufacturers, distributors, and retail. And never shall they meet. That's the theory. It's a relic from prohibition. Um, it allows the state to collect taxes more efficiently. That's why they still have it. Um, in 1999, the state of New Hampshire decided that people could self-distribute. That was a, a neat thing because there's only essentially Miller Coors and Anheuser-Busch in New Hampshire, and if they didn't like you, then your beer didn't get sold. So you're pretty screwed. Uh, anyway, there are two categories in New Hampshire of, of uh, when I got here. One was a beverage manufacturer and the other was a brew pub. You paid the same thing for a license, $1,200 a year, whether you made five gallons of beer or if you made 50,000 barrels. Didn't matter. You could be Budweiser, you could be brewing out of your garage. Still paid the same thing. All the rules were set up to favor larger, um, the distributors and larger breweries. You're only allowed to sell one case per day per person out of your brewery. So if somebody came from out of state like they always do that collects beer and you make 13 different kinds of beer, they can only buy one case of something. And uh, there's fines, of course, if you get caught selling to it. But then again, all the breweries pretty much sold extra cases. So it's happy to note that um, people become anarchists if they stay in business long enough, I think. Anyway, after my brewery closed, I learned a whole lot about the industry because there's a whole lot of things like that single case. And also, you couldn't sell beer over the counter. Now, a lot of states, they had microbreweries. Didn't have that in New Hampshire um, when I started. You could give somebody a pint. I could give um, Steve a pint, and he could drink it right there. No problem. But if I sold him a pint for $2, they'd take my license. Or I could sell him a bottle, and he could take it outside and drink it. <laughs> That's OK, too. So there's no such thing as what you, everyone else in the country considers to be a microbrewery at the time. So. After Manchester Brewing went out of business, um, I was real pissed, so I decided to learn how the law actually worked. And boy, did I find out right away that it was written by lawyers for the distributors. And um, I learned how to change the law, and so that's what this whole lead up is to. Is what I discovered in doing this is how you can actually um, change the law. If you want the law to be different, I know everybody says, hey, if you don't like the law, change it. That's what law enforcement always says. But then as soon as you try, they don't like it so much, as it turns out. I like to use some, um, some fairly simple examples. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to the actual, um, actual laws. This is a good one. And also, nh.gov is the only thing you have to remember, really. But um, um, if you don't remember that, the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance is nhliberty.org. Not NHLA is the New Hampshire Legal Assistance. That's a different thing. New Hampshire Liberty Alliance tells you all kinds of fun stuff. And it will tell you how to look up bills that are pending right now. It'll look up um, the RSAs. RSA stands for Revised Statutes Annotated. Those are the laws of New Hampshire. New Hampshire is kind of cool. All their laws are online. And when they update them, they update the laws too. So you don't have to wonder what's the law. And in Michigan, um, when I left, when I moved from Michigan, they all might as well have been secret. They weren't online. Only lawyers had big stacks of volumes. And they were these huge, uh, and you can still see them in attorney's offices. They'll still have these 
the big the RSAs and stuff from different years, just sometimes for fun, going back to the 1800s. They weren't in the libraries? No. Well, there are some libraries. A law library in a university might have them, but it wasn't a, ex necessarily accessible to you to get at. Now, uh, the, f the reason that we look up the, the RSAs is that we want to change the law. It's helpful to know what the existing law is. Um, some people are really uh, ticked off at uh, imaginary problems, that they think the law tells them to do something when really that's just a regulation the bureaucracy threw in there. It's not even a real law. So they, and the, uh, the main thing to learn is that law enforcement and the agencies that uh, give you a hard time often don't know what the law actually is. And you'll be better informed when you read the law than they are. They probably haven't read it. So one of the fun things we wanted to change this year, and uh, Tim O'Flaherty introduced a bill, we wanted to make poker legal. So there's different ways to do that. We want to find out why is poker illegal? Should it be illegal? Well, good question. RSA 647-2, and we're just going to try to um, peg this one. Uh, we'll go to the different titles. And we're going to roll right down to RSA 647-2. Now, there's only 647-1 and 647-2, really, that have anything to do with this. These are often a little bit off. Uh, OK, let's see if we can peg it the first time. Uh, that's not elections. <coughs> nope. Yep. <coughs> it's under yeah. gambling offenses. Here we go. Now, it's scattered all over. You, you, there's a way to, to get around the, the problem of laws being duplicated someplace else. Now, it's 647.1, lottery 647.2, gambling. We like gambling. Gambling's good, right? If the state does it, then it's OK. But not if we do it. Um, by the way, another law that came into existence this, this year, and it has passed, uh, I understand, both the House and the Senate, is legalizing home poker games. That was a big one for New Hampshire. And uh, this, uh, we did that one too. It wasn't me, but um, someone in our group also did that. What we do is um, 642 gambling. It, it asks, um, it talks about if you permit gambling, you possess a gambling machine, um, you do a whole bunch of fun things. Um, about gambling. And what you have to do, though, is to find out what does gambling actually mean. You might think you know what that means. But here's what it, it, it says. Gambling means to risk something of value upon a future contingent event, not under one's control or influence. Oh, OK. Is poker a game of skill or chance? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> it's actually been, uh, been um, De Christina versus the state of New York. Uh, introduced the, the argument that he could not be con convicted of online gambling because what he did was he played poker. And he said, that's not a, that's not a game of chance. Uh, that's game of skill. The judge didn't, didn't disagree. District court said, you're right. It is. It's a game of skill. Poker's game of skill, therefore you're, you're not gambling. Well, it floated up the line a little bit, and the, the, um, the state eventually ruled that, um, well, it doesn't matter whether you, it was a game of skill or it was a game of chance because um, the state um, statute is written in such a way that it allows the state to ban whatever they want to, whether it's a skill or chance. Well, that's New York. Now, had he done his case here and got the district court to agree with him, well, poker's a game of skill. Gambling's a game of chance. Can't be both. So um, you can influence the outcome. You cannot control the outcome with certainty because poker has an element of risk in it. However, you can, by the way, play Magic the Gathering for money, or you can play Euchre for money, you can play Bridge for money. People do. Um, huge Bridge uh, action tournaments here in New Hampshire. If you know how to play Bridge, that's a really good thing. So um, we once thought to ourselves, well, what we could do is <laughs> we could just say, uh, we could introduce a poker bill, and we did, and it said that poker shall be considered a game of skill with respect to RSA 
So that was a sneaky approach. Now, some of our legislators, including Dan McGuire, said that wouldn't do the job because there's still other references to poker and charitable gaming all throughout the statute. That if you writing it that way wouldn't do the trick, um, but other legislators said, oh, yeah, that would do the job. Okay, work. So now we know what the law says. We know what we want to write. So this is my favorite kind of law. You've, there's a lot of, of laws uh, that you can write. The best ones repeal laws for us. We like to get rid of laws, not add new ones. We just want to carve it out. And then, of course, um, one of our other favorite legislators, uh, Mr. J.R. Houle, said, oh, Ed, I want to play blackjack, so include that too. Because blackjack is also a game of skill, and we're like, well, they're not going to understand this either, so let's throw that in there. Um, later, some other day, we'll get to blackjack. But blackjack also, you could argue, but really it's the only way, apparently, talking to people who play, there's only one real way to play blackjack to win. You can only do a certain number of things, and if you don't, you're going to lose much more often. And you're still not guaranteed to win. However, so we write the law up, it gets submitted. Now, here's the step. First, you're not allowed in uh, New Hampshire to petition to change the law. You can in other states. Uh, you can, can do that uh, in a lot of the western states. You can file a certain number of signatures on a petition and it goes on the ballot. It doesn't happen here in New Hampshire. However, since there are so many reps, estimated at one point for one rep per 30 people, um, however, that's not true. It's only about 3,300 people to one rep. Now, we have lots and lots of reps who are, are Liberty reps in the state of New Hampshire, and I'm going to guess about 88. That doesn't mean they're, porcupine, they're not all porcupines. They're not all FSP participants, but they're all people that you, could, you would probably agree with them the majority of time. And most of them are willing to submit a bill for you. So you want to find a friendly legislator who will send your bill in for you. Now, this is the kind they like. It's one sentence long. You know, so here, throw it in there. Now, what it does is it generates what's called a legislative service request. It goes to the Office of Legislative Services. And that's really a bunch of lawyers, like 12 of them, I think. And they work at the State House. And they take the form. And it could be written in Word. You know, It doesn't have to have all the, the cool things on it, and I'll show you what, uh, what it looks like when it comes in, uh, what the laws are. We're going to go back to nh.gov. What kind of legislative request? Legislative service request, or an LSR. LSR. Correct. And they'll actually give you this, and it says, you notice right up here, um, it'll say there, it shows the LSRs there. Um, it uh, gives you a quick search, a build text search. Well, let's see if I can find this one, just for fun. And um, this was in the, introduced in the House. Senators are tougher to get, get to sponsor your bills. Okay, looks like there's, um, this is ours right here. So it defines poker as a game of skill. It was um, ruled inexpedient to legislate too bad, but we'll get to that um, in a sec. So if we read the text, this is what it looks like when it comes out of the office of legislative services. And you'll see we had um, quite a few of the good guys in here. Um, Tim O'Flaherty was the prime sponsor. The prime sponsor is always written first on these. Then um, Mark Warden, Keith Murphy, and Michael Garcia were the co-sponsors on the bill. And it is a kind of a, it, there, there's a certain format. It follows this format all the time. In the analysis, stuff that's taken out gets struck through. Things that's all new, it's just regular. And things that are added appear in, in italics, so you can kind of see what they're doing. So we write it up, and we say, well, here's what we want it to say. Now, this is um, how the, the attorneys interpreted it was not exactly what we submitted. So what they're doing is they're just saying, well, what we want it to say really is just that um, they wrote it this way. We didn't really like that, the way it came out. This was a, a case of the representative. It was his first, it's his first term. And 
sometimes you need to argue with the Office of Legislative Services and say, no, that's well, not what I meant. <laughs> we want it clearer than that. But it does say card games and poker should not be considered gambling and should be considered a game of skill, meaning the influence of a player's skill on the outcome of the game is greater than the influence chance. Well, um, we did put in an amendment before this bill came to take out that last line right up to after skill, because that muddies the waters considerably if you try to balance this and say, oh, this little dot is more green than yellow, but it's really blue. And that is just too, a little bit too confusing. So <clears throat> what happens then is it will, be, it will go to the Speaker of the House, Terry Norelli right now, and she will assign it to a committee. Normally, this follows some kind of sense. Not always, but sometimes. This one went to Ways and Means. And so if you know things about the committees, Ways and Means means money. <laughs> so what's going to happen? Now, it helps when you're trying to pass legislation to figure out who is going to fight. And this was real easy, <laughs> is that um, the monopoly on poker games in this state is held by charitable gaming. So there's a gambling commission. Ah, now. We have a bureaucracy. Well, they're making money from this. Poker makes up 57% of the revenues. You think they want to let this pass and have it? You could have heard them howl. The, the, the arguments came in, well, we won't have games for charity. People won't play for charity if they can play poker someplace else. And we were like, well, why wouldn't somebody decide just to play for charity? Plus, you have all these businesses that can open across the state, not just a couple monopolies. You'll have people playing um, pro poker professionally all around the state of New Hampshire. And they like to do it. It just proves, you know, that you get all this money from poker. It proves that people like poker. And I'll, I'll do the question, but yes? Right. It does. And other states have established something very similar. I believe Delaware and Nevada at least Delaware very recently changed their law. Says, hey, you can play poker all you want. Fine, good. Um, and that means you can play online, and the feds can't really jump in and say you're, you know, you're breaking the law. Um, right. OK. Once it's assigned to the committee, a hearing will be scheduled. They have one public hearing on all the bills. And so you get to show up and make your arguments. Your opponents will come in and make their arguments. And then other things happen. One of those things is that there may be a subcommittee appointed. That's better because most of the House committees have up to 20-some people, 21 people, maybe 17, 18. A large number of them won't show up on any given day, so you don't have to deal with all of them. The fun part, when you're, if you do testimony training, you can get a friendly rep. Usually you'll have one, at least there will be one friendly rep in every committee and, that you can talk to. So you'd like to do that and find out who sits where. <laughs> you can always go into the committee room for another hearing and write down the name tags are all posted around the horseshoe. You'll show it up at a table like this. You'll be on this side. They'll be on the other side, and they'll have a big horseshoe, and uh, you'll get up. The sponsor reads their bill. This was really short, so it didn't take them long enough. And then they'll uh, normally let, they stagger it, people against and people for. You may have no one on the other side. That's pretty rare. Happens now and again. I'll get to a case where it was unexpected. But you make your arguments, they make their arguments. And what do you suppose the uh, primary argument of the charitable gaming division was? Precisely. And I should take this time to <laughs> announce that there are only three forms of opposition that you will ever face, to my knowledge, and can basically be broken down into three categories. The first one is, we've always done it this way. The second is, your way is going to cost us a lot of money. And the third one is, do it for the children. Or, <laughs> this will hurt the children. Or, if, I, if we don't sell spam and grocery. If we don't force beer stores to sell spam, children will drink. And the Police Chiefs Association actually said that 
in a hearing. <laughs> and they will get to it. If they can work all three of them in, they think they're way ahead. So you think you have logic on your side, but actually it doesn't work that way. What they said was, well, we make about $500,000 a year from poker. And we're not going to have that anymore if we pass this bill. And that was it. So they killed it. Now, everybody uh, didn't vote the same way on it. But let's just say that it goes to a subcommittee. A subcommittee is if they decide they really need to take a look at it and read it thoroughly, make sure they know what's in it. They'll assign it to a smaller group of uh, five or seven people generally. They might even put a Republican in charge. It's happened before. Strange. Very odd. Happens in certain committees. Some don't. Some, don't. some do. Some committees don't have subcommittees. And uh, <laughs> they just hear it once. Then they'll blow it off for two months, get back to it, and they'll vote on it. Period. That's it. No discussion. Subcommittees are a second chance for you if you're trying to change the law. And you must go to every subcommittee meeting there is. Every work session that they have, which would be a subcommittee meeting, they'll talk about it. They'll look at it and, and try to get way in. That's your time to bring testimony in. That's your time to have your friends call the members of the committee. And all their phone numbers are in there at nnh.gov. You find them all on the dashboard. Um, call every single one of them and talk to them is the best way. Second thing is you can email them. You can email them all at once. Or you can email them individually. If you know your committee, very, if you have a really good committee, you can even find out how they're going to vote um, before they've seen the bill. Some committees are like that. Commerce is, a, uh, I don't know how many of you met um, Representative Sandblade or um, some of the, yes. And uh, she's on the Commerce Committee. There's, um, and we have um, Pam Tucker's on Commerce and Laura Jones and Keith Murphy, <laughs> who owns a bar. And even some of the new Democrats, Joe Scarlato uh, is a bar owner and Kermit Williams, who's also not a Democrat, used to own a restaurant. They do beer and liquor and they do banking. So that's a good one to go. Now they do have some people in there that would like to ban alcohol for everyone. Unfortunately, we're going we're gonna to try to get, we want new people in those positions perhaps. But um, you do have a chance if it's something relatively non-controversial. Going back to the, the poker thing, that was all they heard was it will cost us money. The state's very conscious about losing money. Even if you say, well, it, we, we'll have all this construction, we're going to have all these new things built, um, people will have new skills and we'll make all, raise all this revenue and, and stuff like that. Well, the state's going, oh, we're going to, what they hear is we're going to lose $500,000 and that's not going to look good for them because they'll have to make it up someplace and they don't want to. So it's easier to vote no. And, which brings me to another point, <clears throat> it's way easier to kill legislation than it is to get it passed. <laughs> We're kind of in for the long haul. We also um, sponsored another bill we'll be talking about. We'll be having a panel today about um, <coughs> the process of civil asset forfeiture, which Dennis Corrigan was very much involved in. So was I, so was Mark Warden, and uh, many other people, including um, the, <coughs> the Institute for Justice, Americans for Forfeiture Reform. Tough one. Uh, the civil asset forfeiture is when the police stop you and say, do you have any money? And if you're dumb enough to say yes, they say, I'll take that. You might have used it for drugs. And you'll never be charged. They'll just keep the money. Then you have to try to get it back. And they're really good at that game. They've been playing for a long time, and you haven't. You have to sue them. And most people, the average amount that's seized nationwide is about $1,500. Costs more than that to hire an attorney. And they know that. Uh, sometimes they'll go after more, like your car or your house. They did, there was a big case in Tewksbury, Massachusetts, where they decided to try it. Caswell, very good, thank you. Um, where they, discovery, after the fact, this guy was just hanging out at home and got a letter that said, from the federal government, that said, we decided to take your motel because someone was arrested there once for, uh, on a drug charge. So you're fa clearly facilitating this. Now there is a Motel 6 up the road they had had the same thing happen from time to time. They, the owners of the motel had no idea anyone was, was doing anything drug-wise. More, <laughs> yeah. And in discovery, it proved that the reason they chose his motel rather than the Motel 6 was they had no mortgage. And the place was worth 1.2 million. 
Now, if they go through the feds, it's called an adoptive forfeiture, and they take it, and they can get from the feds, the local police department that assists, get up to 80%. And they keep it. So this guy at the Institute for Justice picked this case up, fortunately, for this guy, because nobody has like the two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars laying around that it would and it's been in his family for years and years and years and years and years. Suddenly, you know, bang, they're saying we took it. Anyway, he won. That's the good news, but many people don't even bother to report it. And so it goes on. Well, um, HB sixteen oh nine was a civil asset forfeiture bill that we proposed, and it would have ended civil asset forfeiture in New Hampshire. Right now it's gone through committee. The committee voted against it 14 to 2. They heard the um, law enforcement came up, everything came out of the woodwork, really. So the police chiefs jumped up, the DA's office, the attorney general's office, they all came out and said, they had two things to say. First, they said, we never do this. And then we sa they said, but if you ban it, you'll cost us our budget. <laughs> huh. And they did get a few questions. Uh, and some of the reps were like, excuse me? You know, do you, does, uh, do you charge everyone? Well, no. No, we don't do that. Uh, some of them just give us the money uh, voluntarily. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I wish I was kidding. That, that's actually what they said. Now, it, people don't buy it, but there are apparently some small towns, and I wish I knew which ones they were because I would avoid them like the plague. They get 50% of the, their police department budget comes from stealing, and it is no less than stealing money at gunpoint from people that pass through. Government does. <laughs> right, do they do ever do anything else? Right, no, okay. Uh, they do sometimes pretend to offer services in exchange for the stolen money, which doesn't make it any different. So what, was the, uh, what was the proposed bill? Oh, uh, it's huge, and it was actually, it, it went through, and who is the, um, the prime sponsor, was, was it Spec? Okay. No, 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 for the one, previous one. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, or Dan McGuire, no, Seth, Cohn. Oh, Seth Cohn. Okay, Seth Cohn was the prime sponsor and on a similar bill that uh, actually was, there are certain things that can happen in committee. They will report it out to the full house. They don't get to destroy your bill. They can vote ITL, inexpedient to legislate. They can vote OTP, ought to pass. They can vote OTP front slash A, which means ought to pass is amended. They can also refer to in, for interim study. Now, that can mean something or not. <laughs> it might mean we're going to read it later. And this is a 19-page bill, so some of them I'm sh I found out. Um, <clears throat> we'll discuss this in a sec. But they can say we're going to study it. Well, back in, um, this was proposed during the 2010 biennium. And what happened was they said, we'll refer it to interim study. And they did. And they read it. And they met six times with attorneys to try to get it right so that it did what it was supposed to do and not something else. When they finished it, they said they voted in 2012. They got together in the summertime, and this usually happens in summer or early fall. They got together and said, this is, uh, they voted it 10 to 0 out of committee to pass, but couldn't go to the whole house because that was, it was already over. Now, so that, that just moved on to the next time. It was recommended for further legislation next time. Well, so what happens in 2012? Republicans uh, lose the House. So uh, now nothing happens in 2013. So we bring it back and say, okay, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go for it this year. We're gonna try to put it in 2014. So we put it back in and despite the fact that that same committee had already voted 10-0, bipartisan vote, by the way, to do this thing, the um, now what happens when there's a shakeup of the house is the majority party gets to appoint the chair and the vice chair <laughs> so that has a great impact on how your bill is going to fare uh, if the chair is saying well makes a lot of arguments but well this is they are usually in charge of their party at least so if they tell their party members you know we don't like this or it, republicans they were in charge of it last time they were the ones that passed this we don't like them so what they did was they also convinced some of the Republicans on, on the committee were uh, swayed greatly by law enforcement's arguments that, uh, and always the, the law enforcement conflated civil asset forfeiture with criminal asset forfeiture, which would be like you use your car to rob a bank and they get your car if they catch you. 
you've, you're convicted, you're charged. All we're asking is that if you're not charged, you're not convicted, charging wasn't enough. We decided you had to be convicted to lose your property. Your property couldn't be, couldn't be sold. Didn't say they couldn't grab it, but they do have, did have to, to convict you of a crime in order to keep it. And law enforcement kept saying things like, and, and you don't really know how much they lie until you get into the committee room. And here are these guys, the heads of the chief of police. You know, we never do this. No, and then, well, it's in the record. You know, it says that you seized a million dollars last year. Oh, well, that was all heroin dealers and, you know, this kind of thing. <laughs> okay, uh, and New Hampshire's, the question came up. New Hampshire's got a D rating from the Institute of Justice. But all the surrounding states are better than we are, you know, in terms of this. Oh, well, you know, so what? Big deal. Not a problem. It's not a problem in New Hampshire. All right, so it isn't a problem for them. They get the money. <laughs> they're happy with it. No, things work exactly the way they, they think they're supposed to. Could you yes? Change it so that they just don't get the, couldn't one bill just change so the police don't get the money, that the, the money goes to the yes. defendants, attorneys, or something? It was changed. Here's the fun thing is that when it's sent through the federal government, now, and just to give you a little bit of, uh, here's $950,000 went to the feds. 50000 went through the state because they get, the police department gets the money back. You know how they get it back? Sometimes they get Bearcats and MRAPs as grants from the federal government. Sometimes they get cash. Now they get weapons, whatever. Um, that's where it, how it gets recycled. See, it's not just enough to take your money by taxes. They're just going, going to steal your stuff and sell it, and then they'll use that on it too. So, uh, which is sort of un rather unfair from our point of view. However, um, we'll keep trying again. We'll throw this one again. This is what I'm. I guess my point, and it was rather a long one, is that sometimes these things take many years. You have to jump in. Sometimes you get lucky, and um, things will go through fast. We also worked on um, my partner at Rothbard Sterner and Dobbs, and I also worked on the marijuana legalization bill. We worked on. He worked on um, Kirk McNeil, the head of NHCompassion.org. After many people did it, uh, Phil Griazzo was the head of Normal, I think, 10 years ago. Matt Simon did an awful lot of work with it. Uh, he went to the Marijuana Policy Project in Washington, and Kirk ended up um, actually bringing it over the goal line and getting medical marijuana. So we're very involved with, um, with a lot of these initiatives. And you can too. So you can win. That's the important thing is you can beat them, but sometimes it takes several years and you have to do a lot of work. But what the heck? It's a hobby. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, yeah. Richard. You talked about, uh, like in the context of the uh, poker bill, how you had to keep a really close eye on what actually came out of legislative services. Um, are, are there other ways, like if a bill even is uh, shot down in committee, that you can move to bring it to the full house? Yes, it will go to the full house as long as it gets either um, an ought to pass or inexpedient to legislate. It still will go out if they have for an interim study. If they have a lot of votes, if it's really lopsided, like 17 to 1, it, criminal justice, uh, that's the one that Mike Sylvia is on, right? He's the only libertarian on the criminal justice committee. All kinds of votes from the criminal justice committee come out 17 to 1. And that, <laughs> thanks, Mike, for, and he'll write the minority opinion on, uh, on most of them. So. Yes, if you can get it to the House floor, and we're going to try. A couple of them did. HB 675 um, came out with a recommendation of ought to pass. That was the bill that would have recorded all your license plates in New Hampshire. New Hampshire's the only state that doesn't do that. Does not. Does not. It's illegal here. It's banned. No, in no other state is it, is it banned for the police to automatically record your license plates. They also ban, I think, easy pass, using easy pass to track people other than the toll uh, rather than the purposes of toll collection, which is its intended purpose. Now, I understand they have, they're supposed to get rid of that information in 24 hours. I'm not sure if they do. Remember, they can, the reason that uh, HB 675 was introduced by Steve Shirtlip was that uh, this process was banned in New Hampshire in 2007, but they were doing it anyway. It was illegal, and they were trying to cover their tracks. They got caught doing it. And um, that was a, so they were really trying hard to pass this one. But the Democrats went the other way. And it was something like 250 to 97 was the vote on the floor of the House. They had killed it dead. And the, the gun control bill, 1589, that same thing. Is that we, we were really afraid of losing that one, because generally speaking, 
the Democrats aren't as hardline on guns as the Republicans. And you do lose some from each side. There's some people that have their own opinions and they're not, you're not going to be able to reach them. But it was great. Um, they did a fantastic job and um, they ended up overturning 1589, putting a stake through its heart. It's gone. Unfortunately, now we have a bill from the Senate, SB 244, which would um, require New Hampshire to report various classes of people to the federal government so that they could be added to the NICS check and be not allowed to buy firearms. So we're going to try to stop that one too. And that's another one. Yes, Bill. Could, do you want to give him the... No, oh, thank you. Right. Uh, HB 492 was stuck in committee for a while too and then got out. How did that happen? Well, they have, they have a certain deadline when they have to get it out. They're not allowed. Yes, they do. They can keep it for a certain amount of time and then it has to go. There's a, what's called crossover is in March, everything's got to go. If it's going from the House to the Senate uh, in March, there, you can find it on the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance page. It'll tell you when crossover is. It's also listed in the calendar of which you can find through calendars and journals on the House page. This, so hopefully they have to get it out. It's uh, by law. It has to go. They have to do something with it. Doesn't mean they have to say yes, but they want to get them out too. That means sometimes they don't pay much attention. Turns out that our, our bill uh, uh, for civil asset forfeiture was never discussed. The chair, when we were in there, she said, well, we've been working on this bill. When they, when they passed it, they voted to, to um, ITL it. She said, well, we've been working on this bill for two months. So I called Mike and I said, Mike, did they ever read this bill? He said, no, never had a meeting on it, just a hearing. That was it. And they voted. <laughs> so, Richard, well, oh, how are we doing for time? I'm sorry. Okay, then I don't want to take somebody else's time. So, um, thanks a lot. I'll, we'll be having a re asset forfeiture later. Thank you very much.